Hey guys, welcome to His and Hers Trauma Podcast. Please remember to check out the show notes for resources regarding what we are talking about. We usually have some pretty good stuff linked down there. And Mr. Trauma and I are so happy that you guys are here to learn and hopefully get some good information about all sorts of different trauma and how they manifest themselves in relationships. So with that being said, let's go ahead and get into it. Thanks so much for tuning in. Hey everybody, welcome back to the podcast. Um, Mrs. Trauma here and finally after much kind of like putting this off, I'm going to do part two of sort of my story. Obviously this isn't a super detailed you know summary of what happened within the bulk of my relationship if we did a podcast like that it would take like days to cover um I sat down and I wrote about the things that I felt were most important to share that really like in my gut hurt um and that I used while doing my assessment of whether or not I had been um, a victim of domestic abuse and also narcissistic abuse. Um, it's what I used in my therapy sessions as um, I did EMDR and topics. So I think that these are pretty spot on in, fo- in terms of like what is relevant to me that I feel comfortable sharing. Um, so obviously I'm going to start out by saying there's always two sides to every story, Okay. Um, I'm not here to put anyone on blast or like talk mad shit, even though some of that's going to happen during this podcast. There's always two sides, okay? But I know what was real in my world. Also, I know what to be true was true because I was sober. Um, And I was the one experiencing this. Not to say that this, that my ex was happy. I don't think he was. But it didn't, it doesn't excuse his behavior, okay? So that's really important. It doesn't excuse this behavior if someone's not happy. I wasn't happy and I wasn't doing what I'm about to share with you guys um, to him as he was doing to me. So I've sort of been trying to get into the mindset to record this because it's difficult and I don't want to break down or get too far off topic. So I had to kind of get in the mode and... I recently watched a documentary on Selena Gomez. It's called Me and My Minded Me. I think that's what it's called. I'll I'll correct it in the show notes below. I'll link it. It's an Apple TV original. I thought it was really well done. It it really like targets her mental illness um, and her bipolar disorder diagnosis, which um, is something that's close to me because I am with someone who struggles with similar things and I struggle with similar, similar things as well. So it was really relevant for me. And there's a song that she wrote. um, I think it's called um, Lose You to Love Me. And the the lyrics that really kind of got me in the uh, mindset was, you promised the world and I fell for it. I put you first and you adored it. You set fires to my forest and you let it burn. Sang off key to my chorus because it wasn't yours. Set fire to my my purpose excuse me, set fire to my purpose and let it burn. You got off on the hurting when it wasn't yours. Okay. Those lyrics really speak a lot to me. Um, and it, it, it describes devaluation, which is the cycle that was happening. There was devaluation and then idealization happening in this phase of my relationship, but it had transcended into mostly devaluation. Um, Hey guys, just wanted to take a little time out to talk about something that I am very passionate about because I volunteer with this organization and it is Crisis Text Line. So hopefully you get some good info. Here you go. Crisis Text Line is there for you when you need them 24-7. You simply text HOME, H-O-M-E, to 741741. Then you're quickly connected with a certified crisis counselor like myself. Our goal is to take you from the heat of the moment in crisis to a cooler and calmer space. 
crisis text line is anonymous and we are there to help you even in the most dire of straits. I've been working with crisis text line since 2016 and know how powerful and helpful this resource can be for those who are struggling. Reach out, we're here for you, and we give you options for resources to take with you and a game plan to get ongoing support to prevent more suffering. No crisis is too big or too small. We treat everyone's situations with the utmost importance and are trained and certified to help you when you need us. Check us out and we'll be there for you when you need us. Take care. So um, the shift happened pretty quickly, honestly, after he moved in. And it looked like, for me, confusion. Didn't understand what I'd done wrong to deserve what he had did. Um, he cheated on me and he denied that it was cheating. Um, I reached out to the girl that he did this with and she confirmed that it was true. However, she was very honest with me and said, I had no idea you two were as serious as you were, and we were very serious at this time. We were, in fact, leaving to go on vacation together the next day to meet his family. So in my mind, that's pretty serious, <laughs> pretty exclusive. Um, and it was the first person that told me, Chelsea, you need to watch out. You need to just be careful. This person is different. And I didn't understand what she was talking about. I just kind of thought she was like jaded and pissed off because... She wasn't going to be able to, you know, pursue him. And she just said, you have to keep yourself safe. You have to keep yourself number one. I've seen some things and I'm just concerned. So if you want to hate anyone, hate me. And I said, no, I can't put the blame on you. Like you didn't know. Okay. So that was sort of the first. And that set the tone for the entire relationship, honestly, because he was constantly denying it. We would fight over it. I would bring it up when I was feeling devalued. Um, as an example, and he basically said, you know, well, you blocked me for six weeks because I did. I think I talked about this in part one where I felt something was off and it was, and I blocked him and he's like, so, um, I really don't think you can talk cause I'm not so sure I was feeling sure about us. And I, I know that's just an excuse. It's turning it around on me. It's having him control the narrative because in that time we had, had a long discussion as to why that happened. He understood why that happened. Um, so that's sort of where it started for me. Um, and that was when he started gaslighting me. Um, and he started to really display a lot of insecurities. And he found it threatening that I didn't share those same insecurities at the time. And he turned it around on me as I was a threat rather than an ally to his insecurities because I was always very supportive of him. I mean, I work in mental health. Like I work with people for, you know, I do this <laughs> for my purpose, okay? So I was very aware that it was nothing to be ashamed of at all. But he made me feel bad that I even recognized it, that I was smart enough to recognize it. So that's when he really honed in on my intelligence and devaluing um, that I was intelligent, emotionally intelligent. He doesn't. He just didn't have those types of feelings, that empathy. He didn't have that. Um, so that turned into not having my back when I needed him. It just became very one-sided. And obviously I needed a lot during that time because this was during the pandemic as well when everything fell apart. And I was homeschooling my child and doing mom stuff and trying to be everything but myself. And, you know, it was ridiculous. <laughs> it was so lonely. I was so lonely. The whole tone of this is just loneliness, like complete loneliness. And he would just seem like he would act normal when he knew I was emotional and in crisis and he would not care. Um, a good example of that is when I decided I didn't want to have any more children. Um, we had talked about having a baby and I – at first was kind of on board, but then after so long of this behavior, I decided, you know what, I don't want to have another baby because my pregnancies are high risk pregnancies and I knew that I would be unable to care for myself and my son as well as I, you know, try to do it when I'm not dealing with issues. And I thought to myself, oh my God, 
this person's going to have full control over me if I have a child with him. And my mom, I talked to her about it and she's like, please, please, please do not have a baby with this man. He will own you forever. He will own you everything you do forever. And I, that scared me because I'm, that terrified me because I, I watched how he treated the things that he owned. He treated these things that he owned with absolute disrespect, his own property. So I thought, oh my God, how would he treat me or his child? I already knew how he treated me. It was very um, sobering for me at the time. So I decided to um, get my tubes removed. <laughs> I went into the doctor and I said, what's the most nuclear thing I can do to not have a baby anymore? And she said, well, tubal removal. And I said, let's do it. And I did. And um, after the surgery, this is like a good example of ignoring my needs and um, using his, his like sick, twisted, evil power over me. Um to make him feel better about himself. So I had the surgery. Everything went great. I came home and I was, you know, given some pain medication and put on a, a schedule to take them. Um, he did okay for like the afternoon. Um, um, then that evening he drank a lot and he passed out on the couch and he had my phone because that's where the timer was. And I was upstairs and I, I just, you know, had surgery. I couldn't really move very well. I needed help getting up and down. It wasn't a big surgery, but it was big enough to, you know, feel it for like a good week or so. And I started screaming like at the top of my lungs, help me, help me, help me. Come help me, please. I need my medication. I need to use the restroom. Help me. And I was screaming, screaming, screaming. And he never came. Um, I screamed myself to sleep. Um, I never got to use the restroom. In the morning, um, I called my parents and I said I needed to come out and they were like ready to go. They were ready to show up and they sent me flowers and were very concerned about the place I was in right at that moment. And instead of just saying, I'm sorry, I messed up. Like, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. Um, this person had a tantrum and made it all about himself and he blamed himself so much and he kicked my fridge and put two dents in my fridge. He was screaming and throwing things around. Meanwhile, I'm just like, okay, I really just need someone to take care of me. Um, it's pretty simple here, man. Like, I don't need this display of insanity because he was making it all about him. And um, instead, I just needed to be taken care of. And that never happened. And those uh, dents are still in my fridge. So that's a good example of um, just like annihilation devaluing me um so time went on and you know obviously the baby thing was off the table um then I started to put on a lot of weight okay um when I am depressed I eat <laughs> when I am sad I eat when I am feeling lonely I eat that's sort of a coping mechanism of mine I've gotten past that now thank god with some work um and I have now gotten back down to a healthy size um, but at the time it was getting really bad and even when I was still looking very fit and good he would poke at my appearances joke at my parents at you know my expense to others um, it wasn't funny and it wasn't nice and I I truly think I'm a very attractive woman um, I'm not vain I just know that like I work hard for the things in my life and I know that I have a lot of intelligence behind my eyes and I think I'm a beautiful person okay at least you know I'm getting there <laughs> um but he took that all away from me um he stopped being intimate with me which he knew was um, a trigger for me because why a big part of why my divorce happened was just we got married too young and there wasn't a lot of spark there we were like best friends but not a lot of sexual chemistry okay so he weaponized intimacy and he would withhold it from me. Um, if I did, God, I hate even talking about this, but I have to talk about it. If I even was able to tap into that with him, it was very cold, distant. Um, he was often blackout drunk. He's, you know, fallen asleep during it and stuff like that. Um, I'm a very passionate person. I love love and did not feel very loved. I felt very um, used. 
And then I felt disgusted afterwards and he would just leave the room and leave me alone. Um, I told him, I said, you know, I really, it bothers me. I would try to explain how it made me feel. I said, you make me feel abandoned after we're intimate because you just leave and then you don't call me the next day. It feels like a one night stand, you know, but I'm with you and you live with us here. Like you're my partner. What the fuck is going on? He didn't even care about that either. He's like, you just need to like, you know, figure that out on your own. <laughs> and um, the con- he'd also constantly say like, I'd lose weight for someone else. He'd be like, Chelsea, you'll do this for someone else. You'll do it for someone else. And he would get so mad. And I'm like, do what for someone else? Like, I don't understand what you're even talking about. Now I do, but I didn't then. Um, so that's like, I'll go through a few more examples of devaluing me. He would ignore my texts, telling me I text him too much, tell... Um, me not to text him but when I was like out with my friends or gone on a trip he would text me all the time and still try to be in control Um, he said he would do everything around the house okay that is so not true (laughs) he would do everything to make the house look terrible and then he would do the dishes and like take the trash out I was so beat down and so tired from you know remote learning being depressed because of this person's behavior because of the alcoholism and all the madness and chaos and devaluing that I was going through that I ended up having to hire someone to help me. Thank God she was um, open-minded to what I needed, never judged to what was happening, but she was worried about me. I know that. And And she still is in my life to this day. Thank God she was someone I really could lean on. Um, and he, was very, um, he never did anything with the lawn, so I had to hire a lawn service. I mean, because I'm trying to, like, teach my kid and play mom and be teacher at the same time and then also just, like, breathe and, like, (laughs) try to, like, get through the day. I couldn't do anything else. I needed someone to step up and instead, or just not make it worse, right? Like, I would have been fine doing it alone. I would have been fine without someone. I could have done this. I would have been fine. But he did everything in his power to make life so fucking hard, that it was impossible. So I just started hiring for help and he would get so upset with me um, saying, you know, you're you're focusing on my shortcomings and you're not even giving me a chance to do this. I'm like, yes, I have given you a chance to do this. It has to get done now. And um, just over and over the constant blaming, blaming, blaming. Um, if I ever, you know, escalated at all, if I ever, um, you know, got a little heated or something, he would call me crazy. Um, so I decided to stop cursing and stop doing anything that was considered crazy. I would cry, but I would never yell and I wouldn't curse at him. And I, I didn't do a lot of that anyway. And he hated that because he wanted to make me look bad. And so his tantrums became much more inflammatory after I made that choice. Um, his drinking was out of control the entire time. And he would alienate me from my son with his drinking um I didn't know until afterwards that he had told my son if you tell your mom that I'm drinking I'm gonna you're gonna be in big trouble so he would take my kid and go do stuff and look like the hero to everybody right that's what they love is they love 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 to like have everyone think they're just like the shit okay so you beat me down to where I couldn't do anything and then we would go he would either take my child and do stuff and then drink and then come home And then, no, I would never really see him after that. Or he would just drink at the house, like, behind my back. I used to find liquor bottles all over the house. Um, And when we would go visit his family, I was so exhausted by that time, like, traveling, dealing with the, like, whole getting ready to go, you know, knowing I'm not going to be in my safe place, that I would, like, sleep a lot. And I would say, hey, could you please wake me up at, like, 7.38 so I can have breakfast with everyone and do a morning activity? And he would purposefully not wake me up. Because he knows I, I sleep through my alarm sometimes, especially when I'm that tired. And it would make me look like shit. It would make everyone be like, what's wrong with her? And he'd be like, oh, she's just tired and overweight and not healthy. And meanwhile, I'm like, please, you know, like, just involve me in this. Because I don't want you to, like, paint this picture of me of who I am not. And, and I couldn't control it anymore. It was terrible. It was like a false, like, narrative who I was. And, um... He would just like leave me alone when I cried constantly. Um, He did some really bad things to me at home. Um, 
there was physical and so much emotional abuse. I'm not, I'm not going to give like tons of examples, but you know, there was a night where he almost like killed us because he drank too much and he had, um, I didn't know what was going on because my son and I were in the basement and the basement became like my, my space. And we were watching a movie and hanging out and we went to bed and my, my son was sleeping with me. He usually slept with me at that time. He was really young. Um, and all of a sudden I start smelling smoke and I'm like, what? And the smoke detectors are going off in the house and I have like a three level house with a lot of stairs. And I ran upstairs and I could not see like six inches in front of me. The house was so smoky and I'm like, oh my God. So he, he doesn't have a sense of smell, um, this person, which he really played into a lot. Um, and so I was like, oh fuck, like where, what's going on? The house is on fire. But really what was happening is he had put a potato, like a whole russet potato in a pot of water and put it on high and boiled it. I think he was trying to make mashed potatoes, like wasted. I don't know what the fuck he was doing. And it had gotten, it had been on the, the oven for so long that it started, it boiled the water all down. It started burning the potato. So it was kind of like a kitchen fire. Nothing was on fire, but the potato and the pot were on fire. So I immediately, you know, put that out once I found out what was going on. And then I thought, where is he? And my son was just going ape shit, freaking out. Like, we're going to die. Screaming. It was terrible. My neighbor was banging on the door. Um, her husband is a firefighter. And we're all in, like, our pajamas, like, half naked. It's, like, the middle of the night. And uh, it was just a really bad situation. And I got my son safe with my neighbor outside. And then I started to hunt for my ex. And he was upstairs naked, face down on the bed in the master bedroom, which is my room now, was used to be our room. Now it's back to being my room because he's gone. And I was like shaking him like, wake up, wake up. We got to go. I had a towel, a wet towel to put over his face. I don't know how long he was in the smoke for. Probably like 15 minutes maybe. I have no idea. But he was so blackout drunk and so disoriented that he did not understand that I needed him to get out of the house. Okay. So he started being really combative with me and started like, you know, acting like he was going to attack me. He would go to the doorbell camera and like flip me off while I was trying to get all our stuff together. He was screaming at me. These really like, fuck you, fuck you, you fucking bitch. You this and that. Just you fat fucking bitch. Just like screaming at me, right? All in front of like my child. And I'm like, what is going on? And I'm like, what the hell is going on? So, um, I ended up opening all the windows and getting a lot of the smoke out and I grabbed my my kid and I texted my ex and I said you're scaring my son you're scaring me could you please like leave or could you just stop and he ran downstairs and he started yelling at me saying I wish I could be such as bad of a parent as you are if I could only be that like you're such a terrible mother and he just was going insane he was like a monster and he was coming at me and so I called 911 and I showed the phone to him and it said 911 and my son and I were screaming on this 911 call and he was like fuck you and he ran upstairs all he had was underwear on ran upstairs ran it out to his car and like booked it and left like fucking left so that like you know the all the troops came the fire department the cops there was like guns drawn they're like where is he I'm like I don't know if he's still in the house they cleared the house They talked to me and my son. They asked me for his information and I was terrified. I was, I was scared. I was scared of like what the consequences would be if I gave them his real information. This is how brainwashed I was. I was so brainwashed. So I gave him them like a fake plate number, but I gave them his real phone number. And I didn't hear from him for like two days. And, and, um, when I did finally hear from him, he said it didn't, it never happened. It's not real. I'm like, well, it's very real. And I didn't know where he was. I called the hospitals. I called the jails. I called everyone except for his brother who he used as a, a lifeline a lot because his brother was also a narcissist is as well. Sorry, you are. If you're listening to this, you are. Um, and I felt so um, deflated after that. And after that, it was more of just like I, I didn't love him anymore. My love became fear. I was afraid of being alone because he had told me, you know, you're never going to meet anyone. You're so f- 
I mean, I'm being really honest. You're so fucking fat and fucking disgusting. Who would want you? You're so fucking stupid. (sighs) He said it so often that I like believed it. It was so, so, so fucked up, man. Um, And, you know, these tiny things would keep me in the relationship. These meek attempts or sudden out of nowhere signs of affection, like breadcrumbs, that's what we call them. And like they're really tasty because you haven't had them for a long time. Um, And he continued to weaponize and withhold intimacy from me. Um, He would like play games with me where I would be like wanting to be intimate and then he would get up and leave. Just leave. And I'd be like, oh my God, I was just rejected. And I would start crying and then he would come downstairs and be like, hi, sweetie. Just took a shower. I'm like, you're a sicko. You're a fucking sicko. And then wonder why I wasn't interested and be like, you're, why don't you want me? I'm like, because you just left without saying anything to me. You got up and you looked at me and you walked away like you didn't want me. Then left me for 30 minutes and now you want to come down and do it because you thought it was funny? Like, it's not funny, okay? Um, it made me feel insane. Um he completely took away all of my friends, like my strong female friends. He could see it, they were intimidating or going to be a problem because they could see behind the mask that I couldn't see at the time. And he knew that if they got he got rid of them, I was toast, which is what he wanted to be, me to be. He wanted me to be toast, so I was all his. He really, really did well at that. He alienated all of my friends especially two really good female strong friends. I have one of them back in my life. Thank God she is my world. I love her so much. And she's going to come on and talk as well uh, at some point about what she saw and what she was going through at the same time. Um, That's another one. But um, I'm going down the list here. So like my, you know, my mental and my physical health were still like declining. Then it it, kind of became like I was in a state of psychosis Um, And a false sense of reality. Like I had no idea what was going on. I didn't know what was up from down. Um, I was, I wasn't me anymore. And I had a friend that had told me early on in the relationship, you know, if you don't get out of this, you're going to be a shell of yourself. I was very defensive because of course he had made up the story that this friend had hit on him at a bar when we were out. That never happened. I bet he hit on her, honestly. And he, um, so I was like, you just want him oh god I was so like brainwashed I'm I'm talking about this and it's making me feel crazy but it was crazy and I was so lonely I was lonely for years I was lonely for 80 percent of that relationship but I was stuck because anytime I would try to get him to leave he would say give me this much money and I'll go like five grand it started at five thousand dollars then it went up to eight thousand ten thousand and finally it was like fifty thousand dollars and I'm like you're fucking crazy I'm not giving you any money to get out of my life Like, I'll get you a place and I'll get you, you know, a storage unit and stuff, but I'm not going to give you X amount of dollars. Like, what is wrong with you? It was so fucked up. Um, Just, and he would use my car for work all the time. He put like 40,000 miles on my car, Um, but he wouldn't fill up the gas tank or keep up with the maintenance. Um, He worried more about his friends' well-being than mine. And one of his really good friends who I still care about, I don't talk to him, but I still really care about him a lot because he was great and he saw, I mean, he even said out loud one night, like, dude, you don't deserve her. She's too good for you. You know, he saw the signs. He knew. He knows to this day. I don't know if he's listening to this, but if you are, thank you for being there for me. Um, but he would prioritize their lives instead of ours and my life. Um, He would just freak out, you know, if my friends, and if I got along with his friends, excuse me, if his friends liked me, he would do the smear campaign. Um, He like lived in a Peter Pan syndrome type of life. I, when I found out that he had lied about graduating from college and that he'd never lived on his own, I was like, oh shit. And I was already in it. And I'm like, this person is not a grown up. This is a little boy who still has tantrums, who's a bully, he's a fucking bully, and he's bullying me, and he's bullying my whole life, and I'm like a grown-ass woman, and he did it, he was really tall, he's like six foot two, like 200 and some odd pounds at times, big dude, he scared me, um, and he was incapable of taking any constructive criticism, like you give in relationships, you're like, hey, you use a lot of I statements, I feel like this, 
and you know what can we do to change that or you say hey like I see how this could be improved in our relationship or in myself or in you how can we get there how can I help you he thought I was just like you know tearing him down and I was not I I, I wasn't but that's how he heard it and that's his right to hear it that way but it wasn't what I was trying to do um and it's this went on for years, okay? <laughs> like years and years. Um, those are just some examples, but you get an idea of how things were really bad. And then um, this is the last part of it. So this was right before he moved out. So this was probably, this was the like late summer of um, last year. It was probably like July or no, it was August. It was in August. And... Um, I don't even remember what we were fighting about, but he went insane and he did it in front of my kid. He was screaming at me. He was circling me. He told me to get my gun and die and to kill myself. He said he fucking hated me and that I deserved to die over and over again. He just said, die, die, die. And I was just like paralyzed. Um, he left for a couple days and I thought about it and I let him back but it was so different I was so he you know I told him I think I'm gonna try to forgive you like I really am I want to get to a new place in our relationship I can see how my weight gain is affecting you I can see that it is really a problem I'm gonna change I'll start going to the gym I said all this stuff right and I started doing it um but it wasn't because I wanted to do it. It's just because I felt like I had to. Because I was afraid of the unknown after him. You know, I was like staring down the barrel of 40. 40 years old with a kid and I was I was scared. I mean, everyone can say like, oh girl, like you can do you on your own. Like, fuck that. I, I know I can. But like, I wanted to be with someone. I wanted to love someone. Um... There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with wanting to love and want to be with someone. But this wasn't love. This was nothing. Nothing like that. Um, it's pretty bad. When I um, tried to forgive him, I couldn't. I would like recoil from him when he would try to hold my hand or hug me. And that made him very mad. He would, he got very mad. He's like, you haven't shown me one fucking ounce of love or tenderness in like a week and I just said I'm trying I can't I I don't know I don't know I don't think I I don't love you I don't I can't look at you anymore I don't feel the same anymore after what you've done to me like you it's the last like nail in the coffin for me man and um so he about a week later he, he, he ended it. Um, we were on the phone. We were arguing about who was going to pick up my son from his grandma's house. And he was like, fuck this. I'm out of here, man. He's like, I'm coming to get my shit. I'm done. And I was like, what are you talking about? Okay, I'll go pick him up. Like, it's fine. I was, you know, exhausted from dealing with his shit. So I wanted him to go pick him up. He was in the neck of the woods. Um, and I was terrified. So I ran down to the basement and I hid in the closet. And all I heard was just like a ruckus, like a ruckus upstairs. So he came and just like tore through the house and got some stuff, not, not everything. Um, I mean, honest to God, I'm still finding things to this day that are his. He was so disorganized and just, <sighs> he turned my house into like a frat house. <laughs> so he came and got some stuff, um, but left everything else here and it was sort of like a power play, I think, of like, well, I'm still going to leave some shit here. So, like, this isn't really done. Because um, he knew I wasn't going to go up and confront him or talk to him. He knew I was scared and that I wasn't going to go upstairs and try to fix it. Um, so, it took him like 10 minutes, I think, to leave. And I hadn't even seen him for like two days prior because it was over a holiday weekend. And we'd had some sort of like issue and I was really tired and my son was not here so I usually took that time to like kind of escape and hide so I hadn't really seen him um for a couple days even before this happened 
And I knew we were all going to be coming back together as like a unit, the three of us, and that uh, I was trying to get things ready for that. So um, he just came and blew through the house, then left, um, didn't contact me or anything. Um, uh, that night, I remember him saying he'd call me. Um, I fell asleep and I missed some calls. And I, um, I think I called him back that night late and he said, oh, I was at a movie and I'm thinking to myself like, wow, you're at a movie. Wow. I mean, you must be okay. Cause like, I, I can't fucking function, dude. Like, is this breaking up or what? And he went around and around and around of like, I don't know, maybe it's breaking up. I don't know if I love you anymore. I'm angry. I'm not the guy for you right now. I'm this and that, but I love you. But, but all this stuff, it just went like around in circles for like a while. And, um, you know, I finally opened up about what it was going on, uh, to people. I started to open up because I was away from it and I opened up on Facebook a little bit, but I really opened up to like my close friends and my family and he called me and this was like, I don't know. Uh, I think this was after he picked up his stuff. So he picked up his stuff like three weeks after he left. And I packed up his things, you know, nicely. I don't, I'm not like vindictive. I don't like revenge. Um, I'm trying not to be vindictive even in this recording. I could be a lot more, but I'm not gonna. Um, I'm just saying it how it was for me. So I packed up his stuff like in a real nice way and he was supposed to be here at a certain time and wasn't. And so we just put everything outside. Um, he was so stupid. Just child's play, right? And so he called me um, like over and over and over and over one morning. I had like nine missed calls and um, he had like the, the audacity to call me like sweetie because that was his nickname for me. He was like, sweetie, you know, I just... I, I can't do this anymore. Like, we're broken up. Like, I want to nip this in the bud. Like, we're done. And, like, this is, like, really hard for me. And he started getting all weepy. And I wasn't saying anything. I was just being quiet. And I, I think I was crying. And he just said, so, I'm sorry. Like, I can't do it. Click. Hung up on me. And that was, like, the last time I spoke to him on the phone. Um, and that was over a year ago. And even to this day, you know, sometimes I hear from him. Um, I think I talked about that in the last podcast about anniversaries. If you haven't listened to that, you should. Um, I talk about an encounter that he just tried to pull on me uh, about a week ago, no, two weeks ago now, even after this time and how many things have changed in my life. But the whole point of this is for me to just get this out there um, so I'm relevant for everyone, so people know that I've been through the discard, I've been through the, all of it, the, I idealization, the devaluation. I've been gaslit. I've been triangulated. I have been torn down to the very fiber left of me as a person. Um, I was completely an empty vessel before I decided to just say, you know what? I don't want to live like this anymore after he left. And I'm like, I'm so, why should I be upset? You know, this might be a gift that I've been given an opportunity. I was very, very scared. Um, but I was also feeling brave too because I have good people in my life. I've got good family, good friends, and they were showing up for me in a big way even after I had completely you know, isolated myself. They showed up and they're like, dude, you're fine. You're going to be just fine. Like You just have to start really seeing it and believing it and seeing what we see. And I, I kind of started just educating myself. Um, I started watching a lot of YouTube videos on narcissistic abuse. I started to read about it. I got back into counseling immediately. My counselor was like, wow, are you finally ready to be in therapy and tell me the truth? And I said, yep. And she said, thank God, because it's time. And I got really raw and really real in those sessions. And they were amazingly helpful for me. Um, I cried. I felt stuff. I was angry. I raged. But I I was safe, man. Like, I was safe. I was away from him. I was away from the day-to-day. The chaos was normal. So I felt very 
out of my element. I was so used to it being chaotic that the peacefulness became almost like intolerable at first. I was like, all right, where's the, where's the fucking, okay? Why isn't this happening? And um, it got really hard. It was really hard for me to get used to that being my new normal was like peacefulness and predictability and stuff because it wasn't normal. It was foreign and it was so hard. I felt like, why do I feel so restless and like unhinged and I can't grab onto anything, but like I stood in my ground, like I didn't, you know, self-medicate. I didn't um, check out. I faced my shit. I'm still facing my shit to this day. You know, I still do therapy. I still do work on myself. I, I serve others, you know, through my crisis counseling. Um, I take what I've learned and I put it and I <laughs> apply it to real life. And that's the whole point of this podcast is because of what happened to me and then happened to my husband who I met during my healing process. I'm still healing, right? He's still healing. We just happened to cross paths and, you know, they always say like some, I don't know what the saying is, like you're never ready for what is actually going to happen. And um, it took a lot for me to open up and take the leap because I thought it was a little too soon, but considering the fact that he understood where I was coming from and it had been through something quite similar, we really found solace. Solace? Is that the word? I'm? Peace <laughs> within each other and our presence together. Just being together, we felt safe and we felt love eventually. It was beautiful. It was like taking something that was broken into a million pieces shattered and then putting it back together with like this glue that was glittery and glue in the dark and it transformed into something beautiful this like beautiful thing this fragile but beautiful thing like a precious like token or precious trinket that's what we became individually and then we became one eventually um there's not any part in here. I hope that you're saying that I was always right. Um, I wasn't. I'm a human. That's why I'm saying there's always two sides to every story. Um, but it was unacceptable what was happening. It was narcissistic abuse. It was domestic violence and domestic abuse. That is what it was. Okay. There's no getting out of that. Um, I don't think I made it easy, but I was also in a conflicted with myself the entire time but I didn't make it harder that's for sure I was always trying to cater to him and cater to his needs never the opposite um and now that I'm getting my needs met through myself I realize like I don't need anyone else to fulfill my needs I can do that on my own I'm just lucky that I have a partner that you know wants to help me fulfill certain needs in my life that I love but you don't need to have anybody. You don't have to have anybody to do that. You can do that yourself. You have to do it first yourself. And I did. Um, I'm not encouraging anyone to jump back into the dating pool after this happens. I didn't immediately do that. That's my own personal journey that I will talk about with Mr. Trauma when we record our episode um, as to the timing of things and why I was doing, why I was sort of like putting myself out there. I was sort of like testing the waters like long story short, testing the waters, turning into something very permanent. Um, but I knew that I had to like work on me first and I still work on me all the time. I work on me by being honest about me and what happened and saying, hey, I know I have, I have issues. I'm not perfect, but I'm not this, I'm not a narcissist. I am not deserving of this treatment. No one is deserving of this treatment, okay? No matter what you do. Unless you're the one dueling it out, but even in that case, I really don't feel like anyone on the planet deserves this. I wouldn't wish this on like my worst enemy. So hopefully my story, I know it's not everything, it's kind of short, but I just wanted to point on some examples of things that were relevant in terms of devaluation idealization and then the discard right which is just the leaving and I never got closure I've talked about this before I've never got it I never will you will never get it 
You'll never have a conversation saying, hey, this is why this happened. You'll never have like a heart to heart. Whenever you try to reach out, they will flip it on you again. And then you'll go through the whole cycle of healing again. It's like starting over. So you have to stop talking. You have to stop contacting them. If they contact you, you have to really go no contact. I know it's hard. Um, Again, Andrew and Narc Daily is an amazing resource of how to go no contact. What to do if you're feeling weak in those times. Those support groups on Facebook. If you're feeling like you're going to contact that person, reach out to them instead. Because they'll fill that hole. They'll fill you up with power and empower you to be like, no, this is not right. Or contact me, okay? I will help you. Do not contact these people. If you have gone through what I did and they are out of your lives, they are out. And they have to stay out of your lives. Sorry, my my watch keeps beeping. Um, I'm going to put it on silent. Reach out. I, I know I'm a stranger, but like I've been there. Um, trust that they have nothing but more of what you've already been through to give you. There's nothing new. They're going to suddenly be like, aha. They're, ne- they're not going to have any revelations about what they did. Okay? never No regrets. It's just... You contacting them as being like, oh, wow, I still control this person. So boom, bam, fuck you. They're going to do it to you. And it's going to be worse because you're going to be even more vulnerable because you're going to be completely broken. Okay? Please don't do it. Crisis text line, again, I know I plug us all the time, but if you need to reach out, we'll just listen and let you vent. We'll reinforce the good things that you're working on, if you have no no tools and you don't know what the hell you're doing, we'll give you those, okay? Reach out to me. Look up things online. Look up narcissistic abuse cycle. Do research instead of contacting this these people that are just empty vessels trying to fill them with your beauty, your light, okay? They're taking that from you. They'll suck it dry and then they'll try. If they see a glimmer of it coming back, they'll do it again. They'll do it again. Do not let that happen. You are better than that. Okay? All right. I'm off my soapbox. (sighs) Sending love to everyone. And I hope that this is relevant. And I'm glad it's out there because now I don't have to talk about it again. And we can move forward and talk about other things. So thanks again for listening. If you have any comments or if you have any questions for us, hit us up. I will put our email in the show notes and um, our socials, our social, social medias. Um, I'm not like the best at social media, but I'm trying. But if you reach out to us, one of us will respond. Um, please. And, um, yeah, I'm actually thinking of working on getting a phone number as well for texting. If you need to text one of us or text me, if you're going through something, I can help you. Um, but my first recommendation would be Text home to 741741. That's crisis text line. That would be my first suggestion. Okay? But take care of yourself because the future after all this, it's pretty fucking cool. Not going to lie. If you can get through this, you'll look back and you'll go, oh my gosh, it was so worth it. Not what you went through, but you had to go through it to get to where you are now. And there's a community of survivors out there. And it's an amazing community. And you're part of that community if you don't know it yet. Okay? So take care of yourself. Sending all my love. And I'll be back next time with some more stuff. I got a lot of stuff planned. So I'm looking forward to sharing all of that with everyone. All right. Take care, everybody.